good Thursday evening. How is everyone tonight? We're here, right? And it's like so gorgeous outside. So stand with us. Let's um, worship together. Sprinkle rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Sprinkle rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. Have a seat, everybody. Welcome on this hot July day. Who is thankful for air conditioning? <laughs> I am. My wife's in Texas at the moment. We got some Texans in the room. It's uh, 110 where she's at right now, so could be worse. It could be worse out there. Um, well, welcome. If you got into the room without a bulletin, if you raise your hand, um, one of the servers will get you one. Um, inside, if you're new with us, there's going to be sermon notes, so you can follow along with Pastor Gene tonight. Uh, there's a connection card, so if you take just a quick second, uh, name and phone number will be great. If any of your contact info change, you can put that on. And then on the back is, for me, the, the really key part is, man, how can we pray for you? So there's a spot where you can fill out a prayer request if you need some more room. Uh, for that prayer request, there's a blue card in your seat back. You can fill that out. And when you're done, you can put it in those white boxes in the back right there and drop those off. Um, and also, yeah, thanks, media. You can do this digitally as well. If uh, you're a little more tech savvy, it, it's actually really easy. There's a QR code um, here on the bulletin that you can use or download our app, Church Center, and you can do that all on your phone. It's pretty quick. Um, and if you have any questions on that, I've been helping people with it and I can show you, but it's pretty snazzy. I really, I really like doing it that way. Snazzy. I haven't used that word in a while. <laughs> um, just a few announcements. So it's actually, the, and it's kind of crazy. It's, this is the first time our church here is actually doing a vacation Bible school. It's just nothing that we've done before, but um, the Lord led us to do that, and it's been amazing. So there's 100 slots for kids, and 90 kids have signed up. So it's pretty amazing. Um, so I was talking with Amy because it says 28 out of 40 volunteers uh, for, for helping out, which has been awesome. 
She said, if anyone else wants to help out, um, there's a, two specific things could, that could be really helpful. So set up and tear down. She said, if you're interested in helping set up for VBS and that's how you want to serve, awesome. Be here at Sunday at 6 p.m. So it, it starts the 31st. So what, what day of the week is that? I'm trying to remember. It's this, this, there we go. So it's the Sunday right before VBS, 6 o'clock. Or if you want to help with tear down, it'll be after VBS. That'll be Thursday at 2 p.m. So those are a couple specific ways that you can help if you're, you're being led to, to help with that event. This one's pretty cool, um, an outdoor movie night. So Friday, August 4th on the, our back property here, we've got this like massive outdoor movie screen. It is awesome. And guess what? We're actually partnering with our local police department. So they actually came to us and said, hey, um, when it was uh, the officer came in, she goes, hey, when uh, my husband and I lived in Post Falls, uh, real life Post Falls put on a movie night. It was awesome. What do you guys think about doing that? We're like, uh, yeah, absolutely. So with that, um, the movie's going to be Super Mario Brothers. That'll be fun. Uh, it's it's going to start about 9 p.m. We're going to have free popcorn and hot dogs. We need some folks to help um, serve that night if you want to help uh, either make the popcorn or hot, or hot dogs or serve it. Also, if you want to help get things set up and tore down, um, that would be awesome. So out at the, in the lobby, at our we call it our connecting point at the table, there's a sign-up sheet. So feel free to sign that up. And then, man, there's just tons of stuff going on. We've got softball games this week. My, my team is playing right now. No, I'm really glad I'm here. <laughs> I'm like, good luck, guys. It's 100 degrees and you're playing softball. So we've got a few more games and then the playoffs are starting and then home run derby. There's going to be a home run derby. So I'm looking forward to that. I don't know how many I'll hit, but I'm going to try and then uh, really the last thing I'll mention is guys and ladies. There's, there's specific ways that you can get connected if you're a guy with other guys in the church, ladies with other ladies in the church. We've got a men's breakfast. It's the first Saturday of each month. Our men's hub, we have small groups that happen still throughout the summer, every Saturday morning. Uh, women's ministry, there's going to be some different events going on. My wife's leading a hike up to Stevens Lake on the 27th. So if you've never been there, oh, man, you've got to get up to Stevens Lake. It's awesome. And then uh, maybe the last thing I'll mention, because I think it's very important, save the date. There's a women's retreat at Camp Luther Haven um, in October, but registration starts next month. So ladies, that's an awesome way you can get connected. With all of that said, there's lots going on. Um, I want to read a, a scripture to us in the book of Psalms. This is Psalm 40. I won't read the whole psalm, but I think it, for me, it's, it's getting my heart ready for the message tonight and for worship. So this is God's word in Psalm 40. I wait patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit. How many of us have been in a slimy pit before? I know I have. Out of the mud and mire, he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the person who makes the Lord his trust, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders you have done. The things you plan for us, no one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. Isn't that good? So let me pray for the service. Lord, uh, I'm so thankful that um, you drew us uh, just to this place together tonight, God, where we can um, just sing songs of worship to you, where we can engage in your word and, and just see, Lord, what you would speak to us. Um, I just thank you, God, for each person here on a, on a beautiful July evening in North Idaho, Lord, that, um, that they are here. God, would you just open our ears and our hearts tonight to your word. Um, Lord Jesus, I pray for Pastor Gene that uh, as you've prepared his heart this week for this message, that um, he would just be your, your messenger tonight, God. And uh, most of all, Lord Jesus, I pray that we would glorify you tonight. Pray all of this in your name. Amen. Well, if you can stand up, uh, just take a moment, greet a neighbor, and then we're going to continue with some worship.
right, let's come back together and continue worshiping together. Soul is given peace. I see. 
bring it in the family or in prosperity. May we never forget that He is all that we need. There is something about the name of Jesus. It sounds like forgiveness, it sounds like amazing grace. It beckons my All these pieces, broken and scattered, in mercy gathered, mended and whole. Empty-handed, but not forsaken, I've been set free, I've been set free.
raising up the broken to church. How you doing on Thursday night? Good. I'm glad to see you. Is it summer enough for you? Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? It'd be great if it stayed this way for about eight more months, but we know in a couple weeks winter will begin. 165 days. So I'm glad to see you. I'm Gene, if you're new with us tonight, and so glad you've come to worship Jesus with us. And we are celebrating tonight, I'm not exactly sure why, but we are grateful that God has blessed our church just over and over again here recently with baptisms and people putting their trust in Jesus and make public confessions of faith. And last weekend, we had an opportunity to, to baptize a couple young men. So there's a video uh, that, that we'd like you to watch with us, if you would. Celebrating because of your confession of faith, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, and rise to walk with you life. Because of your confession of faith, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, and rise to walk with you life. You know what I love about that? I, I, I love that that's a dad baptizing his boys. And, uh, and it was pretty cool because they were kind of ready to get baptized. And he's like, you're not getting baptized till I make sure you understand why you're getting baptized. So he made them go through a one-on-one membership class so they could learn everything they could about baptism. And, and he just wanted to make sure it was their decision, not his. And, um, and, and I love that if you know Christopher's story, he serves up here on the worship team. He's one of those guys that that once he, he, he started coming to this church and started being discipled and started um, learning who he is in Christ, it has radically changed his life and has radically changed the way he invests in his boys. So it's pretty cool to see those things happen. And it's one of those things I love about this church is, is you guys are, are taking your relationship with Jesus seriously and, and, and learning to be disciples of Jesus and, and, and be obedient to Jesus. And it's literally transforming the families in this that, that are part of this church and, and transforming our community through your witness and, and through your lives being changed. And I just never grow weary of watching that happen. So one of the things we like to do, if you're new with us, we, we like to, before every service, take some time to pray and get our hearts ready for a couple things. We want to get our hearts ready to hear from the Lord. Um, I was talking to someone earlier, and you know, we did Friday night services for so long that I forget sometimes that it's Thursday. And, and, and so my, my week is just completely messed up. So there's some things that I should have done yesterday that I haven't done yet. And some, I, I don't know if you guys ever get in that spot where it just feels a little chaotic. And then I've gotten a little bit older, which just adds to the whole mess. Um, and so, so it's good to take this time and just relax for a moment. We take that holy deep breath, if you will, and be reminded that God is good. And be reminded that God is on the throne. 
and be reminded that God loves you. And so we like to pray through some things that, we'll, that we have on the screen. First of all, what are you thankful for? What are you thankful for? I, I don't know about you, but I have a tendency sometimes to be ungrateful or to be discontent. I forget, man, Eric, God has done so much in my life, and he's doing so much in, in my life, and he's made so many promises to me and over me. Same with you. So take a moment, just pray, Lord, thank you for, what are you thankful for? I'm going to invite you to pray for yourself. What is it that you're asking God to do in your life or on your behalf? Maybe there's something that you, you know God's trying to work out in you. I love that we can ask the Holy Spirit, who is our helper, Lord, would you help me to, to take this step of obedience? Lord, would you help me? Would you comfort me? Would you encourage me? Would you teach me? Thirdly, I'm going to ask you to pray for other people. Who are those other people in your life? Maybe someone that doesn't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. My grandson just celebrated his two-year-old birthday. And so I, every week I, I imagine his little face in my sanctified imagination and I pray that, that wherever he goes in the world that he would know that God loves him and that he would come to a place where he knows that Jesus Christ is the Savior that he needs to submit his life to. Who are you praying for tonight? Maybe you've got a friend that's just struggling. And then I would ask that you would ask God to show you how to join him in ministering to your friend or ministering to that person that you pray for. And lastly, we're going to invite you to pray for Jesus' church. We invite you to pray for our church that we'll stay committed to Jesus in, in being and making disciples of Jesus. Pray for our unity as we follow Jesus together. Pray for our brothers and sisters at the other Christian churches in the valley. There are, there are our brothers and sisters that they'll be committed to the mission field that Jesus has called them to. Pray for the church around the world, wherever it gathers, that it will be a light in that community. So as we pray, I'll pray for the service in just a moment. I'll be quiet and just give you some time to spend with the Lord. Father God, thank you for being good to us. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for calling us out of darkness into this wonderful light we stand in. Thank you for holiness, that you are holy, God, and you call us to holiness, to be set apart for you. Thank you, God, that you're doing a work in those of us that have said yes to you. Thank you, God, that you're doing a work on the lives of those that you're drawing to know you. Thank you, Jesus, that love starts with you. Thank you, Jesus, that, that as we walk with you, we, we don't have to be afraid because you've made the promise that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you, Jesus, that you hold the world together. Thank you, Jesus, that you have a plan for our, our future, a plan that's good. Pray tonight, God, that we would believe that you are who you say you are and you, we would believe that we are who you say we are. Holy Spirit, would you teach us? Would you empower us to be, just to be followers of Jesus? We love you, Lord, and we pray all of this in your good, good name. Amen. Amen. Um, so those of you, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing some of you are probably here because on, on Thursday night, because Sunday is going to be warm while we're outside. Um, but remind your friends that we started the, the 9 a.m. service. Uh, the, this weekend, the outdoor service starts at 9 and so we're hoping we'll, we'll be done with it before it gets too warm. And, uh, uh, and we'll just see what God does through all of that. And then I think we've got some Olympics afterwards. And so, uh, so some of you, if you don't come back to the, the service, come to, you know, play the Olympic Games and lose to the Jacobs family. That's okay. Um, so tonight, you know, my, my friend Richard, uh, Richard Jansen, one of our elders, 
about the first or second year that we were a church plant, he came to church so fired up one weekend. And he's like, Gene, I just read this thing about the Syrophoenician woman, and you have got to preach on the Syrophoenician woman. And I heard about that from Richard for like eight years. Um, I mean, every time we would, we would be working, um, for a while we were, we were working through different series and trying to seek the Lord's heart on where to go next. And over and over again, Richard would make his play for the Syrophoenician woman. And tonight, we are talking about the Syrophoenician woman. So I'm kind of fired up that we get to do this. And, and actually, we thought we were going to combine a couple of passages this weekend and, and, uh, and maybe combine some stories as we went through the book of Mark. And, and we were at Sermon Club. We do, a, we, we do a Sermon Club every week where Richard's part of it. And we kind of look at the, the Word of God from different perspectives so that we can, I think we get a better view of, of what the Word of God says for the weekend services. And I was like, Richard, I think we're going we're gonna to do like Mark 7 and Mark 8. And Richard says, well, let me tell you about the Syrophoenician woman. So we're just talking about her tonight, okay? And we've called this sermon a faith-filled woman. Okay, and so we're going to be in Matthew, or Mark chapter 7, verse 24 and 30. And then a couple times tonight, we're going to jump over to Matthew chapter 15 because that's a parallel passage about the same woman in a different gospel. But as we, uh, as we jump into Mark chapter 7, verse 24, I'd ask that you would invite you to stand with me as we read the Word of God. And Mark chapter 7 starts out. Jesus left that place, or Mark chapter 7, verse 24 starts out. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. <clears throat> the woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia, she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs understand, uh, under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Please be seated. That's the word of God we're going to talk about tonight. And so there's a couple things that we learn as we, as we tackle this, this passage. One of the things that I find fascinating in 724, it says that Jesus leaves a place and goes to the vicinity of Tyre. He enters a house and he didn't want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. So you know, as, as you look through and, and study the Word of God, why did Jesus go and why was he trying to keep things on the down low and, and keep things a secret? And, and some people believe what, what he's done is he's left the Jewish vicinity that he spends most of his time in and he's gone back over to a place where the Gentiles are all hanging out. So, um, and, and some people believe that he didn't want anyone to know he was there because he's just been getting pounded over and over again by the, the religious kind of persecutors, and he's like, man, I, I kind of need a break. So it, it's interesting. I, I, I don't know that I ever really look at Jesus this way, because when I think of Jesus all the time, I, I think of the godliness of Christ, but I leave out sometimes the humanness of Christ, right? He's fully God, fully man. And it would make sense that he might go there and just be tired of all the people and want to get a break. But here's the deal. He's been doing all of these miracles, and he couldn't keep it a secret. And so the people showed up. And, and so we've got this woman, the Syrophoenician woman. And the first point that I've got in our sermon is, is the Syrophoenician woman was humble. And I want to start talking about this woman. First of all, she's a woman in a male-dominated culture. Rabbis weren't even supposed to talk to women that they weren't related to. So for the idea of her to even approach Jesus, um, it was kind of understood that you would not even, there's no way that a woman would approach um, a Jewish man, um, particularly a Jewish rabbi. Now, it, it would be enough if there was just a gender issue there. 
you know, in that culture, women were kind of known for their ability to have kids, and that was really all that they were worth. That's kind of the way they were looked at. You know, one of the cool things about the Gospels is to see how Jesus gives women value in, in, that, that other people had not given them before. Now, she was also a Canaanite or a Gentile. And, and there was a, a rift between the, Cana uh, the Gentiles and the Jews. The Jews, when they looked at the Gentiles, they looked at them as outsiders uh, in, the, in regards to the things of God. Um, we're going to find out that in the passage, one of the words that the Jews would have for the Gentiles would be dogs. You know, and they, and they would, they would re literally look at them as dogs. And they would look at them as, as, as not worth anything. And the reason why is oftentimes the Gentiles thought they were better than the Jews. They would call the Jews pigs. And, and, and they were like, you, 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 you Jewish pigs, you're, you're not worth anything. And so there was just this huge rift um, when we, we have learned about some of the, the, the racial issues that were going on in that day, that when it came to like Jews and Samaritans, a Samaritan would walk a long way around instead of maybe crossing a Samaritan, a piece of Samaritan dirt. So these racial issues and these, these national issues that we have today, it's not anything new. They've been around as long as people have been people. Now, being from Tyre, she and her people would have been Jesus' political enemies. Jesus is from Galilee. Uh, uh, the woman's from Tyre. So there's like this political and um, national uh, uh, battle that would go on between them. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, when writing about the people of Tyre, where this woman was from, he writes that they were notoriously our bitterest enemies. So there's all these strikes against this woman of having any kind of civil conversation with Jesus at all. So I want you to start considering what's going on in this woman's heart, what's going on in this woman's life. Now, now she's got all of these things against her, and then she goes and she starts talking to Jesus, and even Jesus' disciples try to turn her away. I mean, it's just this amazing thing. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 23, which is Matthew's version of the same story, he writes this. It says, when she starts talking to Jesus, Jesus doesn't answer him or answer her. So he doesn't even, he doesn't even answer her. It's like she's ignoring him or he's ignoring her. I got to get the, I got to get the genders right in that conversation, right? And then his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she, she keeps crying out after us, right? So she's coming to Jesus and we'll talk about why she's there in a minute. And, and they're like, hey, stay away from Jesus. Kind of reminds us of when the kids were coming to Jesus and, Jesus and the disciples are turning them away from Jesus. I wonder how often maybe we push someone away from Jesus and we don't really realize it. I don't, I don't know about you, but that, that's maybe a thing. And so here's the deal. She comes and she's having this conversation with him. And she says to him, she's begging him, that, because here's the deal. She knows she shouldn't be having this conversation with him. She knows that he may turn her away. She's experiencing that he's not listening to her. He's kind of ignoring her. The disciples are pushing her away, but she perseveres. Why? Because of her daughter. Because it's not about her. So we start seeing this thing about her being humble. And, and, and it wasn't about her. We have this thing sometimes that we think that um, being humble is thinking less of ourselves. But what we start discovering is being humble is actually thinking about ourselves less, is what C.S. Lewis writes. She wasn't even thinking about herself. She's thinking about her daughter at home who ha is, is possessed with a demon. And she's thinking, I've tried everything. And who knows what she's tried to help her daughter. Maybe she's you know, she's gone to some of the, the different healers and maybe she's tried all the medicine and, and maybe she's put her money in the thing of the guy that said, if you give me money, I'll heal her daughter. She's tried all of these things and none of these things have worked and she's desperate and she hears this story about Jesus and she's like, he's the one. So we see that she's humble. We see that in this conversation that they're having together, she, she asks in, in verse 26 of, of Mark chapter 7, 
She says um, she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. Now, Jesus is going to have this conversation with her and say, first, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. So here's what's going on. Is he's, and Jesus, Jesus is explaining to her that his mission, that the children that he's talking about are the children of God, the, the Jews. And this bread that he's talking about, remember that Jesus talked about the fact that, that I have bread that you don't know about. It's the bread that comes from the Father, right, that, that we don't eat by food alone. And so he's talking about the salvation. He's talking about this grace that comes from God. And he's talking about the fact that the grace that comes from God is for the Jews first. He says it's not right to give the Jews the children's food to the dogs. So he's, he's literally in that passage saying that she's a dog. Now I want you to notice what she doesn't do. Oh, I knew I should expect this from you. I knew that I couldn't trust you. I knew you would treat me like any other Jew that I've ever met treated me. She doesn't do that. What does she do? She says, <clears throat> but even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She acknowledges, yeah, in your context, I'm a dog. She doesn't try to be someone that she's not. She doesn't try to fight for her rights or any of the, because it's not about her in this moment. It's about Jesus, and it's about the fact that she knows he's the one that has the ability to heal her daughter. So, so notice what happens here. It says that um, she fell at Jesus' feet. She's desperate for his help. She begs him for mercy. A lot of commentators and, and scholars, when they look at her falling, at Jesus' feet, one of the things they say is that, is it may be a form of worship. That while all the religious guys are coming to criticize Jesus, this humble woman who should have been turned away falls at Jesus' feet to worship him and to declare that he is the one that is able to heal her daughter. Uh, he's the one that's able to give her. Here's what she says in verse 28. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. There's even enough grace for those of us that are outside the kingdom of God. And I just believe that you can, you can heal my daughter. There's a couple of verses that, that kind of ring in our minds as we look at this. I love what James chapter 4 says. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. I think in our culture, there's such a, there's such a drive for us to humble our, or to, to, to exalt ourselves over other people, to, to, to tell ourselves, I'm, you know, I'm tall and I'm good looking and people like me. And, 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 and we get on the social media thing where we want to make our lives look good and, and we don't want to allow anyone to see our flaws and see our cracks and we don't want anyone to to see that, that, that maybe we have issues in our lives. And, and, and we even play that game in church, right? We walk into church and, and we've got all our smiley, happy faces and, and we're afraid of other people finding out that, that maybe we're not as perfect as, as we want people to think we are. And, when we've been, and sometimes we've been bred or bred, <laughs> trained our whole lives to feel that way. Your mom and dad maybe told you you had to act a certain way and you had to dress a certain way and you can't let people see you sweat and, and then in the world in the business world you have to you have to get your best at the expense of other people sometimes we've kind of created that world and the thing i love about the lord is we can just come to him in all of our honesty and say lord i'm really jacked up right now lord i'm really scared right now Lord, I really don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. Lord, I'm really afraid for my kid. Lord, this, this, this thing called marriage, it's not going like I hoped it would. Lord, I, the doctor gave me this diagnosis, and I don't know what comes next. It says, humble yourselves before the Lord. Be honest before the Lord. Um, I, I was looking something up, and it says, to humble ourselves before the Lord means to recognize our own spiritual poverty. And to acknowledge, consequently, our desperate need of God's help. And to submit to his commanding will for our lives. That's what it means to be humble before the Lord. And as followers of Jesus, 
we can look to King Jesus as the perfect example of what it means to live um, in humility by faith. Um, look at this in Philippians chapter 2, if you would. Verse 1. Philippians 2, verse 1 says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, and we've kind of talked about this before, uh, a different translation for that word if is probably a better translation is since in, in the original Greek. Therefore, since you have encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tender, tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But man, that sounds completely contrary to the world we live in right now, right? Do not, nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. So as, as disciples of Jesus, we want to follow in his footsteps. So he, he's saying have the same thought process as Christ, and, and your thought process drives your actions who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. See, one of the amazing things about humility is humility comes from strength. Someone who's really, really weak, they can't humble themselves because, because they're already less than. But strength enables us to choose to humble ourselves, to become under someone else, or to serve someone else. That's what Jesus did. He who is God, who created the heavens and the earth, who needed nothing, who needed nobody, who, who is the king of everything, he came to earth and took on flesh, right? Took, took on uh, took on humanity, lived among us. He wasn't born as a, he, di he didn't come born in a castle. He was born in a manger. He served with the lowest of the low people and went to the cross to secure their salvation. That service. And he says, you do likewise. Remember in John 13, when he's in the, when, when he's uh, celebrating the Passover in the upper room, he's with his disciples. He's celebrating the last Passover. And, and, and while he's there, he is the king of the world. But it says in that passage that, that he, he takes off his tunic and he puts a towel around himself and he takes, his, takes the lowest position as the servant by washing the feet of his disciples. And that, that's... He's making a choice to do that. So sometimes we think that humility, humbling ourselves, is going to make us weak. But really, humbling ourselves is a sign of the strength. Why can we humble ourselves? Because we know who we are in Christ Jesus. I don't have to prove anything. Because I am perfectly loved in Jesus Christ. Right? I, I, am, a, I, am, I am God's son. That is what the, the word of God says. I have the spirit of God within me. I, I am perfectly loved, and he's got a plan and a purpose for my life. So when my wife and I are, are, are trying to figure out this marriage thing, which after 32 years, you'd think we'd be farther down the road at figuring it out, but we're still trying to figure it out, right? And, and, but, but the way that it works the best, when we learn to humble ourselves and serve one another, because that's the way King Jesus would treat our spouse. And that's the example that we get from that woman that she just comes to Jesus and it's not even about her. She's just focused on King Jesus and she's like, Lord, would you help my daughter? I'm going to trust you. And she invites us and we're invited to do the same thing. Maybe look a little less at us and look a little bit more at him. 
We see that the, the Seraphonician woman had faith. Seraphonician, that's just fun to say. She realized that she had a problem in her life that was too big and too serious to fix on her own. Right? And I would argue that many of us have one of those big problems in our life and we're still trying to fix it. Whatever it looks like. You, maybe it's your salvation. You're just trying to clean yourself up. And you're hoping that if you get yourself clean enough that God will accept you one day. And God says you can't clean yourself up. There's no way that you can do it. That's why he sent King Jesus to rescue us, to be a sacrifice on the cross, to shed holy blood on the cross. He rose from the dawn on the third day. He made the sacrifice for our sin, and, and he offers us life. The only way to get to God is through King Jesus. It's the only way that we're able to do it, right? But, but then the gospel goes deeper than just our salvation. It also affects our Tuesday. We talk about this all the time, that God wants to do a work in us. You know, I, I know guys that, you know, pornography is such, a, such an issue in, in our culture nowadays, and, and there's guys that are exposed to it at such a young age, and, and it starts affecting them as their brains are being formed, and, and they just try harder and harder and harder to, to get free from it, it once it kind of gets a hold of them. And they're just challenged that, and they're like, if I just try harder, if I just do the right things, and, 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 and Jesus is like, man, are you tired of fighting yet? He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Now, we have a part to play, and I believe as Jesus does this work in our lives, we have a part to play in the work that he does in our lives. But, but man, we can't do it without him. We can't. Humanity is so broken. It's just so broken. We, we, we've got so much, so much junk in this world, not only our sin, but the effect of other people's sins in our lives and the effect that we live in a broken world. And without Jesus, I just got to tell you, I've been living on this planet a while, and the longer I live on the planet, the more I realize without Jesus, we are sunk. And it's kind of hard with Jesus some days if we're honest. But here's the beautiful thing as Jesus begins a work in you. Right, and she had faith. She she realized she realized because she had heard stories about Jesus. She had heard that he had walked on water. She had heard that he had he had healed a cripple's man hands a cripple's man's hand in the synagogue. She had heard stories that he, she, he fed five thousand people with a few fish and some bread. She heard what he was doing. She heard the truth about Jesus, and she believed if Jesus could work in their life, he can work in mine and my daughter's life also. So I want you to think about this. Um, I, I love this passage. So faith is the confidence. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. Okay? Now, Hebrews 11.6 says this, without faith it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Right? It's, it's like, Lord, I, I'm, 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 seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else that you seek will be added to your life. Right? It's, it's putting Jesus first. So often we want to sprinkle a little Jesus on our life and hope that he'll make the changes that we want him to make, hope that he'll do what we want him to do, like he's a genie following us around doing our bidding. And the scripture says it super clear. Jesus is king, and he invites us to come. And in our lives, the most important thing about us is what we believe about God, what we believe about his son, Jesus Christ. I love what Romans 10, 17 says. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So here's what happened, I believe, is this woman heard the true stories about Jesus. And that true story about the work of what Jesus did gave her the faith and the hope to trust that Jesus could do that same work in her life. That's why it's so important for us to get into the Word of God because we need to know who Jesus is because he's better than you think. And you're more desperate for him than you know. This is the reality of who we are. Um, here's a couple things about the... About the the, the transition going on here. She couldn't call Jesus Father because she's a Gentile and she's out of the family, right? So she's not like a Jew. She couldn't call him a, a father because she's not in the Jewish lineage. But what I love is there's a couple things that she does here. In, I think it's in Matthew chapter 15. So we're going to turn there. I'm going to turn there real quick. I just want to read this to you. 
Um, uh, in, in verse 15, verse 22, a Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him, came to Jesus crying, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering ter terribly. She's acknowledging who he is, son of David, right? At some level, she knew who he was. She also is saying, have mercy on me. Okay, when she says, have mercy on me, she's not saying, I deserve anything from you. How often do we go to God and we're praying and in the back of our minds, we're like, because God, you know I deserve this. You know I deserve it because I've been good. You know I deserve it because I'm born in America. You know I deserve it because I went to church today. She's like, I don't deserve anything. I really realize that I'm out. I got nothing. I'm completely dependent on your mercy. But somehow she realizes who he is. She believed when she talked about, there's a, a couple different versions of the word dog that's talked about in this passage. One is savage dog. So when Jews would look at Gentiles and they would call them dogs, they would call them dogs, kind of savage dogs in the street. It was kind of the way they would look down on them. And what she is saying when she talks about the children and the bread falling, the crumbs falling to the dog, she's talking about the dogs that are in the house. Yeah, they're not, they're not the kids. They may be a little bit less than. But you know what? In, in a house, when the crumbs, I don't know, maybe this happens. We had a dog named Charity when, I was a, when, 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 when my daughter was two um, for years. And it was funny, when my daughter would eat, Charity always seemed to be at the foot of her chair, right? And she would be, why? Because she knew that there were crumbs coming down um, from our daughter to Charity, and she would eat those crumbs. And that woman's kind of putting herself in that same place. I, I realize that I'm not a Jew, but I believe that there's enough grace and mercy for the children and for those of us that are coming next. Now, here's the other thing I want you to think about. The book of Mark is written to a Gentile audience. So what do you think, as Jesus starts ministering to this Gentile woman, what do you think the Gentiles that are reading this, how would that encourage them? Right? They're like, the kingdom of God is for us too. Okay? The last thing that I want to I wanna bring, uh, the other thing about the woman that I find kind of interesting is as we've been going through the um, parables of Jesus, talking through those, remember last week, Jesus told a parable, his disciples got him aside, and they're like, hey, would you explain that to us? And he's like, you, you guys don't get it yet? Are you really that dense? She's one of, she, I think she's the only person, right, that understands Jesus' parable first thing. That's just a weird thing. I, I think it's kind of cool. The other thing we see about this woman's faith is she was persistent. She was persistent. She calls out to Jesus. He ignores her. For some people, that would have been enough for them to say, okay, I, I asked the wrong guy. She calls out to Jesus. The disciples try to push her away, right? What does she do? She keeps on asking. She calls out to Jesus. He says, it's not time for you Gentiles yet. And she says, I get it, but I believe there's enough mercy and grace for me now. Why? Because she's desperate to see her daughter healed. Have you ever been that desperate where you're willing to keep asking God? I think so many people, and I'm one of them, have a tendency to say a prayer, okay, that's handled, or God didn't answer, or whatever our excuse is, and we kind of quit asking God because maybe we're not that desperate. Maybe we really don't believe that he can do what he says he can do. But this woman is... Um, is, is, is persistent. She kept asking mercy or God, uh, Jesus to have mercy on her and to heal her daughter. Why? Because she believed he could do what everyone said he could do. She believed that Jesus is who he says he is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 says to pray continually. Right? The Bible says to pray about all things. I love in, in Luke chapter 18, if you'll turn there, there's a, a passage that Jesus is going to tell his disciples, tell, to share this passage with them, to help them understand that they should always pray and never give up. 
And so Luke chapter 18, verse 1, it says, starts like this. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. We don't know how long a time. I mean, we know how the wheels of justice turn. That may have been years, right? For some time he refused, but finally he said to, to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. I love that. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring justice, bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? He t I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And so there's this idea there, right? He said it really clearly at the beginning. He tells them the story because he wants them to keep praying and not give up. I've heard stories of grandmothers that have been praying for their grandkids for like 50 years. I've heard stories of wives who are praying for their husbands for, for 35, 40, 50 years, hoping that their husbands will come to Christ, and it hasn't happened yet. And what do the women do? They keep praying, and they keep trusting that God is able. And they keep trusting that God can do that work, and they keep trusting the promises of God. I think one of the things that, that we need to do as Christians, is we got to develop a little spiritual grit. we got to develop some spiritual muscle. There's this, this whole idea in our world right now that, that God of, if God is for you, that everything's going to happen right away, and it'll be so microwave, and it'll be so high-speed internet-ish. But that's not how our God works. Our God works on his timeline, not our timeline. And I want to tell you right now, God is for you. He is for you. He's for you. He loves you. He proved it by sending his son Jesus. Right? He's for you. We, that, that we know. Okay, so I got a couple application points real quick. First of all, a disciple of Jesus should be known as being humble because Jesus is humble. How are you doing in that area of your character development? Okay? If you're not sure, ask others who know you and are willing to tell you the truth. Okay. You, you know, I, I, this is my, my little weirdness. Um, it says that uh, Moses was the most humble man on earth. Do you know who wrote that? Moses. But it must be true somehow because it's in the Word of God, right? That, that one always kind of amazes me. I can't make that same claim that Moses did. I'm just over and over again reminded of my pride and sometimes I'm reminded of my pride with my false pride which masquerades as humility but really it's it's out there it's my pride being generated in a way being expressed in a way that you'll build me up because I'm tired of patting myself on the back I kind of wish you guys would secondly is your faith in God or only in what he can provide Ask God to show you where and when your faith is misplaced. Sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers the way that we want him to, right? And, and we get angry at God and we rail against God. And sometimes that's because our faith isn't, what, isn't in God. It's in what we're hoping he'll do for us. It's in what we're hoping he'll deliver for us. And I got to tell you, God's ways are not our ways. Sometimes God does something um, that doesn't make sense to us because he has a bigger plan going on that you and I just can't see. And sometimes we have to be humble enough to trust that God sees more and knows more than we do. And then the last one, how's your spiritual grit? Ask God to strengthen you when you feel weak. Ask others to help you when the load is too heavy to carry it alone. And practice praying. One of the things I love about this church is we've got um, more mature people and we've got younger people in the same room and sometimes in the same small groups and in, in the same conversations. 
And, and sometimes the older people, um, we, we look at them like they're old and they're washed up and they have no more, no more worth and no more input. And one of the things that we desperately need, and, and some of you younger people that don't know this yet, one of the things you desperately need is you need some old saints in your life. You need some old people in your life that, are, that, that will come and teach you how they've, they've survived the minefields of life. They can teach you about the things that maybe the mistakes they've made. And, and olders, you need to help the youngers know that life's not perfect and you've messed it up sometimes. But they also need to, you need to help them know how, the, the, how, how you've developed some spiritual grit, how, how you still are walking with Jesus through all the, the victories and the challenges of life. We need those older people in our life. We need those more mature saints in our life. Sound good? And practice praying. Practice praying. Not just when your wife drives. Pray. <laughs> Thursday night. <laughs> and, and, you, and my wife's not here tonight. <laughs> um, all right, we're going we're gonna to pray. And then uh, I, I just love the Seraphonician woman. I love... You know, I love that she's humble. I love that she, she her faith was, was focused right on Jesus. And I love that she was persistent and she kept going. And man, I, I'm hoping not only can we learn from Jesus, but we can learn from the interactions that Jesus have with people. So I, I hope we're able to learn from her. So Father God, as, as we look at your word tonight, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would confirm that word in our, our hearts, that you would show us uh, maybe where we're, we're missing it, Lord, or, or maybe when we're just on target, Lord. If, um, if, if I, I, I believe that there are people in here that are humble and, and maybe don't even know that they're humble. Um, I believe there are people in here that have soft hearts, God, and sometimes their hearts are so soft that when the Word of God comes, it almost, it almost feels like condemnation instead of conviction. So I pray, God, that by your Holy Spirit, you would teach each one of us what we're to hear. And, and Lord, I just pray that, that God's people in this nation especially, but, but around the world also, that we would become people that develop some perseverance, that would develop some grit, that would develop some staying power, that we would become the ones that would follow in the footsteps of Jesus when it's easy and when it's hard, because the world is desperate to see what real followers of Jesus look like. May, may we be those ones. May we be humble and willing to admit our, our mistakes and our missteps. May we, we, we be quick to repent. And may we understand that we are here for a purpose, God. We are here to be your ambassadors, to love people, to serve people, and to tell people about a perfect God who wants to save them for eternity. We love the Lord and pray all of this in your good, good name. Amen. Thanks, church. Well, church, uh, we're going to take a time of communion together. Um, if you're new with us tonight, we uh, offer communion at every service. You don't have to take communion. It's just something that we want to offer to you. Um, we have what's called an open communion table, so you don't have to be a member or even this be your home church. Um, just simply ask that you're a believer in Christ. And if not, you can let that pass by, and um, there's no judgment in that. We just... We're thankful that you're here and, and pray that um, the service is spoken to you. So with that, servers, if you want to pass out the elements. So this time of communion, um, why do we take communion? We need to, to talk about this for a minute. We're remembering the amazing gift of salvation that you and I have been given through Christ Jesus. One of the scriptures that, that helped me... Um, just be in that right mindset, um, just have that, that humble heart before God, is in Ephesians 1 and verse 7. In him, so it's speaking of Jesus, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. God's amazing grace. You know, it's something that I heard a, a long time ago that always stuck with me and that just relates to this scripture is for you and I on our worst days, when, man, we just, we sin, we're just struggling, we stumble. On our worst days, you're not beyond the reach of God's grace. 
His grace is sufficient for any of your sins. And on those good days where you're like, man, I got up on time, I got my quiet time, I was praying, I was nice to my kids, whatever it is, on those good days, we're never beyond the need of His grace for that humility piece. Um, you know, we're supposed to really remember um, why we take these elements. And another scripture that speaks to me is in Romans 5, in verse 6. And that says, You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, when Kevin was still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good, per good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us, for you, in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's what we're remembering. And the Apostle Paul, um, he, when he speaks of communion, um, this time, this Lord's Supper, he says we ought to examine ourselves. And, and one of the ways that I believe we ought to examine ourselves is, do I have any sin to confess before I take communion? Is there, is there anything that I, I'm just trying to hide from God? He knows it. He wants you to, to uh, just turn to him in repentance. And so that confession piece, let me read you this scripture as an encouragement in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he, speaking of Jesus, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So just take a moment, talk to your heavenly father. Maybe you need to confess something. Maybe you just need to thank him for just how loving and good he is. And we'll take communion here in just a moment. In the book of Matthew in chapter 26, we see the Lord's Supper, um, this time that Jesus was spending with his disciples before he went to the cross uh, to pay for our sins and then to resurrect on the third day. And it says this in verse 26 in chapter 26 of Matthew. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. So this is Jesus' body broken for you and I. Then in verse 27, Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. When you take the juice, remember, Jesus has paid for all of your sins. Remember, he said, it is finished. And then it ends in verse 29. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. The other part of communion is we're looking forward to the return of Christ or for us to meet him face to face. So Lord Jesus, uh, I thank you for this time of communion, God, where we can uh, be reminded of the, the great price that was paid for our sins, God. Um, we would be reminded that, um, Lord, your grace is sufficient, that there is nothing, Lord, that we can do that can ever separate us from you, Lord Jesus. There's nowhere we can go that's outside of your presence. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for uh, just this time in your word tonight. And I pray, God, as your word has spoken to us, as the Holy Spirit um, is working inside of us, that we would respond, God, and just have a, a strength and faith in you, Jesus. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to have uh, one last song if you want to stand and join us. And there will be a few of us around the room if you would like any prayer.
I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Because your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name song because it's all true. More than anything, I want you to know tonight that you are loved by Jesus. Regardless of what the world's told you, regardless of what your past actions have told you, regardless of what that little voice in your head tells you, the truth is you are loved by Jesus and there's nothing that can separate you from that love. I love you, church. God bless you. Have a great night.